Hello everyone. In this video, we're going to talk about endothermic and exothermic processes. So on the left side of your screen there is a photo of one of my students making ice cream in a bag. So what you do is you take a small plastic bag and you fill it with a mixture of three things. Half and half, like coffee creamer is what I'm talking about. Half and half, half milk, half cream. And then the second component of the mixture is sugar. And then the third and smallest component is just a small amount of vanilla extract. And so what you do is you seal that small bag filled with those three components and you place that small bag inside a larger bag filled with a mixture of ice and salt. And so by mixing the ice and salt together, that mixture is going to get very, very, very cold. It's going to absorb a lot of energy from the surroundings. And it's going to, like I said, it's going to be very cold. And notice that my student here is wearing gloves to protect her hands from that very, very cold bag because you have to hold the bag, you have to roll it around and shake it up to freeze that mixture into frozen ice cream. So that would be an example of an endothermic process. On the right side of your screen, there's a photograph of myself setting fire to a big heaping mound of bubbles filled with methane gas. And so we can see that there's this big, beautiful flame that is uh, so high that it's actually touching the ceiling. It really freaked some of my students out. They thought they were going to they thought I was going to burn the place down. But I try to tell them over and over again that I know what I'm doing. I'm a professional pyromaniac. And so we see essentially that there's a lot of energy being given off. And if you look closely, you can actually see my arms pointed outward. Uh, it kind of looks like I'm summoning a demon or something crazy like that. And so just by uh, hearing the context of the first minute or so of this video, you probably already have an intuitive sense of what an endothermic process is and what an exothermic process is. Uh, but just to solidify our understanding, let's go ahead and uh, define the two terms and sort of compare and contrast these two processes. So for something to be endothermic, by definition, that means that the system is going to gain heat. And so it follows that the surroundings are going to lose heat as that system absorbs that heat from the surroundings. And in an exothermic process, the opposite is going to happen. The system is going to lose heat. And of course, the surroundings are going to gain that exact amount of heat that has been lost by the system. So endothermic and exothermic, not only do they refer to the system gaining or losing heat, but they also refer to the sign of delta H, which is the change in enthalpy. Now, if you're not sure what enthalpy is, you can look at my last video, which discusses the topic of enthalpy. Uh, essentially, enthalpy is just heat under conditions of constant pressure, which are very, very common. And so in an endothermic process, delta H is going to be positive. It's going to be greater than zero. And so we can see here that delta H follows the same sign convention that delta E follows, the change in internal energy. And what I mean by that is that anything done on the system is considered positive. Anything done on the surroundings is considered negative. And so as you've probably already uh, figured out, in an exothermic process, the sign of delta H is going to be negative. Delta H is going to be less than zero in any exothermic process. Also, in an endothermic process, you can actually tell if the sign of delta H is positive or negative just by feeling the container. If the container is cold to the touch, that tips you off that you have an endothermic process. The system is taking in heat. It's taking in thermal energy and your hand being part of the surroundings is going to get colder because it's surrendering heat. It's surrendering thermal energy to that system. Conversely, in an exothermic process, the container is going to feel very hot because energy, thermal energy is being released. The surroundings are gaining heat. And again, your hand, that's not part of the system. That's part of the surroundings. So that released thermal energy is going to warm up your hand and make it feel a little bit hotter. So let's talk a, a little bit more depth about that thermal energy that is either released in an exothermic process or absorbed in an endothermic process. Where does that thermal energy come from? So say we have an exothermic process. We know that energy is being released by the system, which means it must belong to the system before the exothermic process. But where did that energy come from? Do you think that the kinetic energy of the system was converted to thermal energy as it gets released into the surroundings? Think about that for a second. Do you think, again, I'll ask the question again, do you think it was the original kinetic energy of the system that gets converted into 
thermal energy as it's released into the surroundings? The answer is no. And the reason why it, this cannot be possible is because if the system were to lose kinetic energy, <clears throat> If the system were to lose kinetic energy, then the temperature of the system would have to fall because, again, temperature is just a measure of average kinetic energy. And we just saw a moment ago, like as in the methane bubbles burning example, the energy or the uh, temperature rather of the system and the surroundings is going to get higher. So there's no way that the energy that is released by the system was the original kinetic energy that that system had before the start of that exothermic process. So that must mean that the energy that was released in the event of that exothermic process must have come from the original potential energy of the system. And remember, the potential energy of reactants or products in a chemical reaction comes from how those subatomic particles, those protons and electrons, are arranged, those electrostatic forces between them, the ionic bonds, the covalent bonds, and all that. And different arrangements of protons and electrons give rise to different potential energies. And so that's what we're going to talk about. So to get an, an idea of how uh, potential energy of atoms and molecules works, with endothermic and exothermic processes, consider two scenarios. Consider a scenario in which you have two atoms that are fairly far apart from one another, and they're too far apart from one another to be attracted or repelled by each other. In other words, you can think of it like they don't know that each other exists because they're too far away to notice each other. Now consider a situation in which those two atoms are very, very close to one another to the point where they're actually bonded together either by an ionic bond or a covalent bond. Well, in the latter situation where you have two atoms that are bonded together, well, the protons from one atom are gonna stabilize the electrons of the other atom and vice versa. And so that stable scenario corresponds to a very low potential energy. And so bonding actually lowers the potential energy of the atoms to be bonded together, which is why atoms like to be bonded together. They're not unlike ourselves. People don't like to be alone. They like to be with each other. And atoms are kind of the same way. They're much more stable, much more happy, have a much lower potential energy when they're bonded together. And conversely, when atoms are far apart from one another, well, they don't get to enjoy that stabilization effect that they would have if they were bonded together. And so when they're farther apart, they have a much higher potential energy. And so imagine a scenario where we have a bond and we break that bond. Well, what we would be, what we would be doing is would, we would be going from a state of low potential energy to a state of high potential energy. In order to make any system go from a state of low potential energy to a state of high potential energy, we're going to have to add energy to that system in the form of thermal energy, heat, or enthalpy. But what if the opposite was the case? So in other words, what if I was going from a state in which the atoms are not bonded together to a state in which the atoms are bonded together? If I was going in the opposite direction, if I was forming a chemical bond, well then I would be going from high to low potential energy, and then that difference in potential energy wouldn't be just lost to the universe, it would have to be released into the surroundings. And so this would correspond to an exothermic process. So we've seen here that the breaking of chemical bonds is going to absorb energy. You have to put energy into that system in order to get it from low to high potential energy. So bond breakage, by definition, is an endothermic process. It takes in heat. On the flip side, forming a bond is going to release energy because again, going from a state of high to low potential energy is gonna cause that difference of energy being released into the surroundings. So therefore, bond formation is exothermic. So again, bond breakage, that's endothermic. Bond formation, that's exothermic. And in the event of a chemical reaction, you have both things taking place. You have bonds being broken in the reactants on the left-hand side of the equation, and then you have bonds being formed in the products on the right-hand side of this equation. And so this chemical equation here describes the coming together of hydrogen gas and oxygen gas to form water. And so if we look at this reaction molecule by molecule, on the left-hand side we got two 
diatomic hydrogen molecules and one diatomic oxygen. And on the right hand side, we have two water molecules, each containing one oxygen and two hydrogens. Again, on the reactant side, those chemical bonds between the hydrogens and between the oxygens are going to be broken. And so for that brief instant, the system has to absorb energy to break those bonds because the bonds don't really want to break. The atoms don't really want to be far apart from one another. They'd rather be bonded. So you have to put energy into the system in order to get that to happen. And then on the product side of the equation, we have new bonds being formed. We have four new oxygen hydrogen bonds that are being formed. And then the system is going to release energy during the formation of those bonds because again, you're going from a high to low potential energy. And so that difference in energy is going to be given out. It's going to be released. And so in any chemical reaction, what determines whether the reaction is overall endothermic or exothermic is simply the relative amounts of energy that are absorbed in the case of bonds breaking in the reactants or released in the event of bond formation in the products. And for this particular reaction, this reaction is going to release a lot of energy. Um, I actually have a video where I actually uh, carry this reaction out. And if you like, I can put a link in the description box for you. But this reaction is going to release a lot of energy, meaning that the sign of delta H is going to be negative. It's going to release energy in the surroundings. Therefore, we would call this an exothermic process. And again, an exothermic process, that means that the energy was re that was released when the bonds formed in the products is far greater than the amount of energy absorbed during the bond breakage in the reactants. And so that's what it means for a chemical reaction to be exothermic or endothermic. It all depends on how much energy was absorbed when you, when you broke those reactant bonds versus how much energy was released when you formed those new bonds in your products. Okay, so I hope this video helped you out a little bit, gave you a little bit better understanding for exothermic and endothermic processes and chemical reactions. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to shoot me a question and I'll get to it as soon as I can. Thank you very much for watching and as always, have a wonderful day.